Welcome everyone to the September 11th System Thinking Ontario. Um, the topic for today is uh, sustainable technology and the entropy argument. And the way we're approaching this, um, uh, we've actually had sessions on entropy before with System Thinking Ontario, uh, and it's been a challenge. Um, so uh, given that Badra and uh, Kelly recently visited David Hawk, I'm using that as an excuse to revert to the old System Thinking Ontario method, which was we put up a research paper. Uh, people, um, some people may read it, uh, but the, it exists. And this one is actually from 1998, which is in uh, the year that I actually joined the ISSS. And David and I were at the conference and he remembers me, but I don't remember him. But I do remember him from the next year, from 1999. Mm -hmm. um, so um, because there's been so much um, that's gone on with uh, that uh, David continued to write, and he has uh, a book on this now. I thought that we'd actually retreat back to the basics um, because when I looked at the paper again. It's like, wow, this is actually pretty clear when you read it. Because um, uh, I think David over editorializes at some point. And so maybe easier just to back off to the paper and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and start from there. So um, the plan will be, uh, we'll go around the circle. Uh, we have our usual opportunity for people to um, introduce themselves, uh, let us know where you're from or where you are at this point. And the question is, um, how much systems and entropy are, have you been exposed to? Um, so um, let me share and I'll go down the list and I'll welcome a few people. Um, so Don, say hello. Hi. Not sure I understand that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've probably been exposed to a lot of entropy because I live in a world that's running down. But um, I don't know whether that makes me more or less optimistic. <laughs> I was once told a, uh, a coach, that is to say a life coach, who said to me, you know, you've got to look forward to the future. I said, I'm not too worried. In another couple billion years, the sun will explode and all our problems will be nullified by that. And she didn't like that. But it's kind of the way I think. And uh, I don't know. I think uh, some of the... I don't want to go into this. We'll, we'll wait till the discussion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, mean, Don. It... Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Uh, okay. Nishat. Nishat, say hi. Hi. Oh, okay. Hi. Maybe you can hear me. I don't really have much to say. Uh, I, I think I was exposed to entropy through traditional high school physics. Uh, this is really interesting because to, I just realized today is 9-11. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, and uh, on 9-11, 2001, I was in high school taking a physics one exam on that day when, you know, uh, all that stuff ha happened in New York. Mm. And uh, I was taking physics one. I wasn't, uh, we weren't really taught entropy in that class anyway, but I did, I did get exposed to entropy and laws of thermodynamics, reading textbooks like Richard Feynman's uh, textbooks and Resnick and Halliday's textbooks the following year. And those, those kind of mainly came up you know, from the Carnot heat uh, engine and Boltzmann's famous laws of thermodynamics, you know, you know, you, you like closed systems with closed gases and gases diffusion, et cetera. So I came, I came to hear about mostly from high school and, you know, the famous textbooks, but I, 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 I haven't really delved much, much into it. Thanks, Nishat. Rose, haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, how much? I, I really enjoyed the part of the paper that talked about the um, the history of this topic in systems thinking, because I hadn't been exposed to that. So that was new. Um, in terms of exposure, um, same as Nisha, sort of, you know, my previous exposure, and then also just my interest in um, regenerative economics and limits to growth and all of that. Um, so it, it's a kind of a one of my favorite topics. Thanks, Rose. Joanne? Where is Joanne? 
Hi, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm Joanne, I'm a student, so uh, I must say I don't know much about entropy. Um, I do know a lot about um, working in the world of sustainability, but more from a business context. And so I have sustainability mm. fatigue <laughs> in terms of how things are defined and how we think about um, the solution space. So there were some really interesting things that came up in the article for me. I'm, I'm really interested in learning from you all. And I came to you via Peter Jones. So I've been to a few meetings, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm excited to hear what you all have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. We're all students, and so it keeps going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Francis, Franziska, and someone, and who else is that in there? And mm -hmm. Sean Patrick. And this outfit is not by choice. <laughs> we just realized now we're both wearing blue stripes. Oh, so. the state make yeah. it work? <laughs> we're, we're your entertainment for the evening. Hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Francisca. I'm a consultant for startups, mostly focused on educational technology and learning design in Toronto. And entropy, it's been a while. Um, I think that's all I say. <laughs> Um, my name is Sean Patrick Stencil. I uh, also wear blue striped shirts. Um, mm -hmm. Entropy, I think, as other people said, I was introduced to it in high school, haven't seen a lot of it since in the technical sense. Uh, but as I mentioned at Past Systems Thinking uh, Ontario sessions, I work with Greenpeace Canada. We use systems thinking and campaign design. So that a part I liked in the article was it talked about the attitude towards a problem. And that actually comes up a lot when you're trying to assist run public campaigns because you're trying to shift attitudes that hold up the whole system. So I thought that was actually a useful little leverage point for the non-scientists. Over. Mm. Thank you. Elena. Hi, uh, Elena Leonard here in Toronto. Um, I guess I'm more familiar with it from the information uh, standpoint, having um, with mm -hmm. the human use of human beings and the Shannon and Weaver work. And now I'm kind of interested in the idea of, um, which seems to be getting a little more controversial, of negative entropy being equivalent to information and negative negative entropy being equivalent to misinformation. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. Thanks, mm -hmm. Elena. Uh, Tim, you want to say hi? Hi there. Uh, nice to see folks. Um, yeah, uh, similarly overexposed to both systems and entropy, as Don pointed out. Um, so, uh, and and yeah, similar, I guess, historical engagements in educational programs around technical subjects, learning about physics and mathematics and things about entropy and stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, and I've just read the article, and 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 I, 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 like like Rose said, it's it's. It's really helpful to see uh, the intersection of these different uh, subject areas and disciplines and, and converging on, on systems uh, topics. So, so it's a great, rich subject, interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Ibram. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ibrahim uh, uh, al -Jan. I am a, uh, I'm a PhD candidate. Um, in systems engineering, and I came here to learn from all of you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so in reverse order for the people that are going to speak, um, David Hawk, you can wave hi. Uh, you can, uh, we'll get the introduction uh, later when you come back in. And Kelly Okamura, you can wave hi. Um, and so uh, the, the challenge I gave um, Badra, um, there's too many Mohammeds, and so we can call him Badra, uh, was to actually look at the paper and for people that haven't summarized, haven't read the paper to try to summarize some of the main points or whatever struck him. Um, mm -hmm. So, so Bod will have the opportunity to talk about uh, what he's figured out about the paper, what he hasn't figured out with the paper. And then we'll have Kelly add on to that. Um, and uh, after that, we'll kind of have open field. Um, David Hawk will have the opportunity to uh, answer some questions and we'll kind of go around the circle. So Badra, go ahead. Thank you so much, David. Hello, everyone. And uh, as David uh, introduced me, like my, my name is Badra, and uh, I had the pleasure of actually meeting uh, with David Hogg and having a trip with Kelly and David Ng 
visiting uh, David Hogg at his place uh, two weeks ago. And I have to admit that this has been, uh, as I always say, like a milestone, a transformational point on so many fronts, on like knowing the person as well, definitely, but also building deeper understanding of like many of the discussions and, and the topics that has been, um, we've been discussing either like through System Thinking Ontario or even other groups as well. And uh, today uh, is uh, definitely one of, I would maybe call one of the assignments <laughs> or maybe one of the uh, potentially uh, outcomes of that trip. We're actually trying to make sense, at least to me, that's my objective, make sense of of, uh, of the whole idea of entropy and neg entropy and how they do, how both relates to each other and then how the, uh, the, 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 the two constructs actually translates into the I would say attitude, as David said, but I would say even behavior and and our posture towards um, sustainability and technology and how we're actually improving or improving the human life and the human uh, experience and the human impact on the planet. Uh, so, yeah, without more rambling, uh, let me set the context maybe first uh, before jumping in. As David said, that I'm I'm a we're all students, but I'm definitely the maybe the the uh, the the what I would say not necessarily the youngest, but because not it's not age. I mean the youngest in the journey, <laughs> a student here. Uh, so let's just set the context that I've been trying to make sense of so many things about this paper. Uh, by all means, entropy itself, like what what actually is entropy mean, and and also to give a bit of uh, history and context, not not I mean uh, about where I came from and how I came to the system thinking group. Uh, it was through like my job in, in software and technology and trying to make sense of like leadership challenges. And that led me to a few uh, starting points when it comes to um, human relationships and how it relates to the business. Long story short, uh, that got me into uh, introduction like to system thinking as a, as a, as a way of thinking and also as a, as a way of approaching problems, which is very, uh, which is one of the main points that actually David Hawk has been discussing in this paper and made a lot of sense to me. And then um, a, f a dear friend introduced me to uh, David Inc, who amazingly introduced me to almost half of the people on this call. <laughs> so this is where I'm coming from. In terms of entropy itself, as Nishat specifically, and also most of you as well, my intro or my uh, my background about the term comes from like just study and, and school, and not necessarily, uh, like sadly, but I believe expectedly, not necessarily getting deeper or deeply understanding what exactly does that mean, and uh, which is one of the main objectives for me uh, with that exercise that I'm doing today. So, yeah, uh, the second point in the context I would like to set is that uh, in a previous meeting with David Hawk, I was telling him that I hope that I'm not doing this service. I'm not doing this service by actually trying to explain that. So this is not by all means an explanation or a or a way to communicate what David Hawk is trying to say. <laughs> Not, never, but I would say this is my attempt, like to uh, make sense of of uh, of few keywords, as I said, like entropy, like entropy, a uh, few things that are actually other keywords that came out of the paper itself, uh, which is coming from the very beginning of the whole paper, which is human beings and being human, and that actually I have to admit that this launched me on a on a a, a small rabbit hole journey, it stayed for about maybe two three days, uh, also. Uh, deeper understanding or maybe proper understanding when David Hawk says optimistic, what exactly he means by that. And I have to admit, David, like, this is my first time to understand what you meant by being optimistic. Uh, so, yeah, what I'm trying to say is, here is that uh, I will try to convey what I got out of the paper, as David Ing uh, said, and also some of my uh, connections that I was able to make, not through my thought, but at least through uh, between the the points or the discussion that we had either in system thinking Ontario previous sessions or um, uh, like some of the writings and some of the other publications of, of David Hawk. And uh, as I said, by all means, these are my interpretation or my understanding. And then I hope that David Hawk, Kelly, of course, would challenge that and add to on top of that. But also David Hawk would correct the understanding or at least pinpoint where we might have missed something or maybe hopefully like a uh, hit the nail on the head. <laughs> so yeah, jumping right away, I would, as I said, like from the very beginning of the whole paper, like the very beginning, the very 
starting words, which is like human beings and David's challenge or problem or observation or questioning how they act or how they be humans. But I would not uh, dig into that a lot. I will leave that to the end because I believe it makes sense. And so the very next thing, which is actually an entropy, I have to admit that, okay, entropy, I know like from physics and from study, but again, like what exactly does that mean? And I have to admit that I don't necessarily yet have like a, a deeper uh, intuition about it, but maybe from at least definition, one definition stood out to me as I'm reviewing uh, was it's the amount of, um, it's the quantity of the energy that is not transferable into work. And I believe that maybe shed some light or, or made it slightly clearer to me, like what exactly we're talking here. I mean, like there are so many uh, like ways we can define entropy. And like with all the intellects in this room, I, I can imagine like I don't have to do that. Or I'll say, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm even able to do that, but I'm, I'm trying to convey like the, the definition that maybe uh, got my attention or, or helped me with the rest of that, with the rest of the paper as well. And the reason why is that when, when it identified actually a certain quantity and that the challenge is that fact or that nature of of reversibility, as David Hawke explains later on, the fact that it cannot be transformed into work. And I believe that's maybe the key word that uh, brought some sense or, or some, mm -hmm. uh, like put it into context within the rest of the paper. Like it's, it's, it's about that challenge specifically. And, and from there, uh, I would jump right away to optimistic. And as as I said, like David and so many others of you as well, like always mentioned being optimistic. But I have to admit that how David Hogg actually explained how the paper explained being optimistic and connected that with the arrogance of the human experience and the arrogance of the human knowledge and the fact or the the illusion that we are actually in control and we're able to even start to think about neg entropy and reverse everything and even start to defy like mortality itself. So from what I understood that the paper talks about optimistic is about that belief or that posture that we're taking towards environment and specifically the resources we have in the environment, the resources that are actually necessary uh, and uh, for our own existence. And the way we, the posture we have about it and the way we think about it, that it's infinite or that it's just there to be used, not necessarily to think deeper about beyond that and how how we should embrace it and how actually we, we think about it even in a more, uh, uh, not holistic way, but to, 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 to think about how we interact with those resources, not necessarily about just an, an object or something that is there, there to be used and it's is infinitely available. So to me, that was a big, uh, maybe a light bulb, at least from being able to understand and being able to keep up and follow up with within other uh, conversations, like when we may mean optimistic, what does that mean? And from there, that led right away to the, as, as like understandably like pessimistic, like is actually anything that promotes or anything that challenges the idea of uh, of neg entropy or the or challenges the current uh, state of how we deal with those resources. Is it the opposite? Is it pessimistic? And again, not necessarily, because actually, it is not about being optimist, like being optimistic or being pessimistic. It's about how, like similar to the comments that has been made earlier, like it's about the attitude we're having towards the problem. It's the attitude we're having towards resources and our environment, as opposed to, uh, like you know like like black and white or zero one or whatever the the, the opposites that we're thinking about so what so when we say that the the opposite or not necessarily the opposite actually what we hope that we bring the attention of the public and also we hope that we start to embrace versus um uh, versus the current practice which is how we can embrace entropy how we can actually not deal with entropy but actually like like Maybe you can say that take it for what it is, and and respect <laughs> respect the nature of of the resources in our environment, and also put mm -hmm. that into context um, within uh, within how we interact with our environment, with our, how we interact with our planet. And later on, I will get you uh, the point where I, I started to make sense of how this actually relates 
to like practical everyday like each one of us in our own fields or work or even our own everyday uh interaction with our own environment as well so but the point back to the point is actually optimistic versus pessimistic which is actually again optimistic as in the 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 way we think and the way we we approach the idea of resources and environment and the context we're living in and pessimistic which is not that being pessimistic but actually the 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 counter argument to that or the counter practice that we hope we is awareness about where how we actually embrace the resources on our nature how we think about the environment and the context and and then from there we can come up with um actually not necessarily coming up with solutions, but actually before coming up with solutions, from there we identify the a more crucial or the more um, uh, effective problems that needs to be solved, our questions to be asked, and then come up with solutions for those problems or those questions, as opposed to, uh, like as the paper later on explained, like jumping on or at, le or at least focusing on um, sustainability as the translation of neg entropy. And then it's all about resources are being there and how then we can reverse their use of resources or at least how we preserve this closed system um, and, and bring them back where it, it has been uh, like the, the the motivation or at least the direction where the either the, the scientific community or the system, the general system thinking um, generation has been following versus actually trying to think about it completely different as how we embrace that and how how we can approach actually life in a different way not necessarily to go after the the usage of the resources um from there like maybe the last part which i i have to admit this is the part that i'm still struggling with which is actually neg entropy i mean from what the paper is explaining and from what i understand from the discussions we had before yes neg entropy obviously is the opposite of entropy or trying to reverse entropy <laughs> And and maybe one thing that was uh, like clear to me a little bit, which is how like when we label or actually when we describe some of our practices we're having today or some of the fields or the studies or even the direction of the scientific process and the scientific approach today, how we label that as adopting the idea or the concept of neg entropy, I believe maybe that has been clear to me. Like it's the idea of focusing on the like the solving the problem of the irreversibility of resources and actually thinking and being optimistic that it could be reversed. And then from there, we can focus on all of our effort trying to find neg entry solutions or neg entry type of a solution to the problems we're having today when in reality, well, at least that's the hypothesis when reality actually we're like, we might be running after like a mirage. Uh, so that has been clear, but I have to admit that I'm not necessarily I did not necessarily uh, develop or, or develop a full understanding, or maybe deeper, as I said, deeper understanding or intuition about like neg entry as 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 the the, the counter practice or as the the the, the counter uh, approach we we human beings are trying to adopt for, for, to to attack or to respond to entry. Uh, finally, I would go back to the the very beginning statement that I said. This, it makes more sense actually to to keep it to the end because when I read that first statement, like human beings and the observation of how we are being human, and then it hit me actually maybe the first time in my life to realize that actually when like the the word or the term beings, <laughs> like actually it's. <laughs> Similar to what David Hogg was saying about the resources, that they are just there to be used. Like, beings is just to be there. Like, I believe this might lie at the core or maybe at the heart of the problem of the attitude that we are beings, but just to be. <laughs> or actually, mm. focus should be on the human part. <laughs> mm. So maybe that that, that was the, the rabbit hole I, I was talking about. And then I went to actually try to go and understand or read maybe more and learn about like that idea of, okay, human beings, so what, I mean, what, we, we know all that there are other beings, but like, are there other beings to be human as well, other than mm. the humans? Anyway, this might be, <laughs> I might start now to sound a bit confusing, but I have to say mm. that it's clear to me the fact that by maybe carefully thinking about our existence or our being <laughs> mm. and how that relates 
as the as the whole paper is actually trying to raise awareness, how that relates to the environment, to the resources in that environment, and the relationship and or the the relations between those resources and between us, and definitely between human beings uh, themselves. Uh, I believe that maybe brought some awareness in, into my understanding, even though I understand the main topic of the of the paper was about entropy and trying to bring that awareness as well. But it, it just hit me that it, like like understanding the nature of, of, of that being and how entropy is part of that as well. And and again, because we are part of nature, we are part of the universe. So we definitely still, I mean, not still, we, we are, uh, we follow the laws of the universe and we follow the laws of entropy as well. But to take that to the relationships, to take that to our understanding about our own relationships with each other and also with the environment, I believe that gave me maybe a, a, a different perspective or a different view to think about the term human beings. And maybe that leads, yeah, that that could be like my 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 next step is to think about how that can help build the the, the attitude, as we said, like a, like which is the belief about that that's even possible, and then to to adopt like a different attitude towards the problem and understanding of entropy, which hopefully would lead to going into a different direction other than neg entropy. Whether that other direction is the right one or the wrong one, I believe the question here is not necessarily right or wrong or good or bad, but at least observe and, and accept the evidence that we have seen over the past several decades as the paper has been talking. And also let's not, I mean, I'm reminding myself and everyone as well, like let's not forget that this paper has been written in the 70s, uh, sorry, in the, in the late 90s, but also was talking about uh, like, it was built on some of the foundational work that has been done in the 70s. So that has been obvious since then. And over the past 30 or 40 years, a lot has been has become even more obvious. Uh, so, yeah, w w without further details, these were like some of the highlights I had about the whole paper. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure of that, what everyone was expecting from me to uh, to. Uh, to uh, to present, but I still uh, I promise you the the like the slide deck not necess not necessarily to have a slide deck, but because I was working on something like just to visualize what I'm trying to say. So you still uh, I promise you to send you that <laughs> later on. Um, yeah, and with that I would maybe uh, open up like or hand it off to Kelly. Like, how did that make sense? Making sense to you, Kelly? What question you may have? Or uh, yeah, if we, if we go on the long car ride again, then yeah, it'll eventually make sense. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna start with um, just one of one of the points that that was made in terms of a definition of entropy, and it was that uh, uh, all things decay, and so I, I think that um, as far as entropy and neg entropy, which uh, a lot of my work, um, my former work, was on. Um, Neg entropy, that uh, quarterly profits would continue to increase, which was sort of an artificial versus a natural form. And uh, around the time that David wrote this paper was around the time that I started talking to my clients about um, stop making crap. So we were going into a different um, paradigm shift and I wasn't quite sure, I didn't know at the time that stop making crap still is valid. It was a wrong way to approach the uh, problem with uh, executives in the company, especially when I was looking to have them change their business model that they had learned in school and all, and all the rest. So I certainly, um, I know one of the things that um, you were speaking about was op optimism and, and pessimistic. And mm -hmm. I know that David Hawk said to me in Iowa that uh, he, he gave, use the definition of an optimist from the devil's dictionary. He says, no, that's not what I mean. Um, so I'm going to use the word hopeful, and in the de definition of hopeful, I think that it is, um, there's no guarantee, but it's worth the effort to try. And I think that um, part of my mission is to plant seeds, and whether you want to call that um, optimistic or hopeful, uh, I'm still uh, okay to be on on that road. Um, 
the neg entropy is generally an artificial versus the natural. I think somewhere in the paper it said something about that there isn't a, a solution. I, I would argue that the seven generations for the matriarchal model uh, is something. I, I am the fourth of a generation uh, Japanese Canadian, and so it's it's quite easy for me to. I knew my great grandparents, and um, it's easy for me to see my children's great grandkids. So in decision making, uh, they would all relate back to that uh, uh, decision making. I think somewhere in the paper there was also something about happiness, and actually that was probably on on uh, short term gains, uh, long term pains. Uh, but there, there was a part about happiness and it, it was, uh, I really appreciated getting the information that you can choose to be happy or not. And I thought, wow, you know, if it's as simple as that, um, that's an easy choice to make in terms of if I do this, then I will be happy. And if I do that, I won't be. So it was a, a really good metric for me to uh, be able to uh, make decisions uh, about my life that clearly put me in a state of uh, not that typical, but David Hawk and I have gone over that. Um, Kelly, you're weird and, and we just won't go in that, in that area. Um, one of the pieces that Baudry, you, you spoke about in terms of um, entropy and, and neg entropy, uh, I think we've generally covered the difference between all things, um, decay and neg entropy, uh, the solutionings in terms of how a lot of the industrial forward uh, has come from in terms of just trying to keep it going and, and increasing those quarterly profits based on um, finances for uh, a few, but uh, with certainly not taking a look at the externalities in terms of um, it's out of sight, out of mind. And especially when we moved industry from domestic into global supply chains, then all of the pieces that we had legislation in Canada in terms of uh, environmental, um, you, you can't dump your toxic uh, dyes into the river systems. So they could do it overseas. But hopefully I can also share with consumers that when you get that cheap tomato, that looks beautiful. It was probably uh, fed by some of the toxic waters that came from the cheap clothes. So it's part of my mission as well in terms of to be able to change part of that thinking. Uh, if my if my uh, uh, former clients were correct that they could still make money the old fashioned way, uh, th they were absolutely correct and they made a lot of money from from the uh, 2000s when I thought that they would change the next season. Uh, certainly it has not been a financial uh, reward, but it has been a very enriching uh, uh, journey for me. Uh, I think I've just lost my point in terms of... the neg entropy and that, and that it, it, it's not sustainable. I think that when we were looking, uh, David, you had said something about recyclable and uh, on the, we end up in recycle. And so at some point, just like with cottons, when we're looking at how we can make um, fashion or textiles uh, circular, and with, especially with cottons, it became a problem because it had a lifespan. It eventually wore out as opposed to nylons. Uh, so when I was speaking to schools, they would talk about, um, I, I, I would say to them that polyester might be a, uh, a better circular choice because we can actually take it back down. But I do find a problem in terms of some of the work that we were talking about, uh, the three parts. Uh, where are they? I'm looking for the three parts, David, in terms of uh, And I hope to get to black holes, but I'm looking for that piece on uh, the, 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 Energy information. And... Yes. Yeah. And, and how it is that we can, we have created um, a false or an unnatural world where we believe that we're at the top of the chain but I, I wish I could uh, 
bring up the name of the person that says we're in the middle and we're in the middle of a system uh, and we are not as as important as we like to think that we are it comes in part of the teaching that came from uh, a headspace of negative ent entropy that we could continually increase uh, quarterly profits as well as uh, live forever and that somebody would save us as opposed to um, an easy easy example for me is taking all of the body uh, systems uh, that are holes onto themselves and then everything outside the body and all the systems that are there. So one of the choices that we have is what we uh, choose to eat and how that affects our uh, body systems is something that is uh, doable. And it is a part of um, uh, somewhere it talked about um, instead of policing, it was much more about informing. And so that you got rid of the the uh, the uh, what's the word the ignorance the, the blissful ignorance. I certainly was so overwhelmed as 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 a as a black hole system that I had so much information in my head that I it was really hard um, at times in August because I, I only had so much space. David, when you, you spoke about um, ex, uh, explaining entropy at black holes, uh, I find that really interesting. And the article that I had referred to earlier in terms of uh, the black holes being uh, contained, there's an exterior and an interior, but it's not necessarily a circular shape. It's more like a squishy area that has a uh, containment but what is contained within is uh, particles. I like threads better because we we speak in systems changes learning about threads. And so these various threads that both Badra and I, we probably have in terms of, we're not actually able to weave uh, uh, a concrete message yet, but they are are there and they are waiting to be uh, um, articulated in a, in a more formalized way. I believe Kelly, you were trying to refer to the work of uh, of Garrett Hardin. Is that the one that you're on? The one about the uh, the common and how freedom in a common brings ruin to all. If not, then yes. So I'm trying just to help you remember. But over over time, that that it is not sustainable. I mean, I I agree with David Hawk. I've I've had the pleasure to uh, to have one-on-one -on -one sessions with David. And so certainly I agree with him that the um, nature of the entropy law uh, holds and looking at open and closed systems and what that looks like as well, uh, whether it's a closed system, then entropy um, was valid, but in open systems, no. Uh, that has changed in terms of a direction for uh, systems thinkers to go down into is uh, really interesting. I feel badly for um, the lack of of, of examples. Uh, I've, I've certainly tried myself in terms of being able to provide um, to business that yes, this is a, a, a viable business model for you. That that was um, stupid of my part to go down that track. But even something as small as uh, starting local with my remarkets and now scaling them across Canada, I'm, I'm really proud and it, it's not gonna make me a dime. But I hope that in that, again, we go somewhat into recycling, but it's that there's enough, uh, the consumers have enough stuff that we don't need to buy more stuff. We actually have things that don't need to go to landfill as quickly as they are. I'm gonna stop there and just see if either David Hawk or otherwise uh, somebody has some points because I've got some other ones, but I, I, I do wanna give, uh, this is an opportunity for a dialogue for uh, the group. What, did I shut you all down? <laughs> no, just coming off mute. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll give David Hawk an opportunity to respond um, to what he's heard from Wadra and Kelly. And for other people who have comments, if you can put up your hand, I'll cue you in and uh, let the conversation roll. Uh, David Hawk. 
Okay, uh, unless someone else wants to uh, add to this, I, I pretty well know what I'm going to say. And so I'm sort of bored with whatever I'm going to say. So if somebody wants to enrich the pot because it's beginning to cook and uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to enjoy dealing with the cooking pot. So if anyone, there was a hand up with Francisca or not? No, okay, yeah. okay, good. Uh, let me make a few comments. Um, my uh, relationship with this thing called entropy began back in the early 60s, uh, in part because of my bad behavior relative to authority. I was banned from any college preparatory courses in high school. So I was not allowed. I could take shop courses, agriculture courses, or library, but I was not allowed to take math, physics, English, whatever. And so in the library, I got to read a lot of books, which were much better than the courses. And I learned about thermodynamics and other areas of, shall we say, science during that time. So I, I quite enjoyed it. Then when I went to Iowa State University uh, as electrical engineering, in my first course was on physics. And the instructor was talking about thermodynamics. And at the end of his opening, I asked if he was going to talk about the second law or entropy. And he said, no, of course not. There's no reason to talk about it. We're not even sure if it ex exists. And then he continued. And then later in the hour, I really raised my hand and said, uh, can you explain in more depth why we're not going to touch on entropy? And he said, no. And then he went on. And so each class meeting, I would raise my hand and ask if we're finally going to get to entropy today. And he would say no and move on. He did fail me in the course, which I deserved to be failed. And so that was it for the physics course at Iowa State. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, which is, shall we say, 60 years later, uh, I have a friend who's one of the editors of Science Magazine. And he knows quite a lot about the crap that I work on. And in fact, he did a brief presentation of the Too Early, Too Late, Now What book in order to get comments. And he got uh, something like 2,000 comments uh, on a science website relative to that book. So then he's talked to me recently about sort of my uh, idea of entropy explaining a great deal of why climate change is going to prevail and climate change is going to define uh, where humans go. And so in essence, the entropic principle is quite crucial to climate change. So he and I have talked about what I might do and I blame uh, business courses and business schools very much for continuing. And so I've been working with him writing a paper, which will be submitted to the leading journals of business programs. And he wants me to collect the reviewer comments and write an article in Science Magazine about business schools interpretation of uh, entropy and the second law of thermodynamics, as well as climate change. And so presently I'm writing that paper a little bit with his help, but it's becoming so humorous and so much fun. I think it's not gonna work because the humor sort of shows through and it doesn't seem very serious. But nonetheless, there are 60 years in between and I'm still sort of on that same routine. Uh, to be a little more helpful relative to Mohammed and Kelly, uh, in essence, entropy means there is no such thing as recycling and no such thing as sustainability. And in order to demonstrate that back in the 70s, I worked with the uh, pulp and paper industry as part of my large project from 75 to 77 done in Sweden. 
And with one of the major pulp and paper companies, which they agreed with me, uh, they did a demonstration of what happens when you recycle paper. And in a plant, they set up the demonstration to throw, show that you can only recycle it three times. And it really turns to shit after the third time. That in essence, it has no value for anything except to put in a ditch someplace. That in essence, it cannot be reused, cannot be recycled. All of that is imaginary stuff that humans make up to feel better, to feel better about what they're doing. And so we documented that in that research project and essentially nobody liked it, nobody paid attention to it. That was considered an ugly piece. And uh, even the government representatives were unhappy about that piece. Nonetheless, uh, I do believe entropy discounts the idea of recycling and sustainability. So whenever I see those terms, I think that uh, we're talking about negative entropy. And uh, negative entropy for me is somewhat humorous, uh, certainly doesn't exist. Uh, I sort of reached a peak with that concept back in, uh, as I've talked about before, in 1980 at a conference in Toronto. And in that conference, Carl Sagan, if you've ever heard of him, uh, Carl Sagan and I gave a joint presentation to the World Futures Conference in 1980, where he, in essence, uh, addressed a number of things relative to the cosmos, including the importance of entropy, the fundamental importance of the second law of thermodynamics in the cosmos. And then I gave a joint presentation on negotiated order and my research project in Sweden on how humans try to pretend that negative entropy exists. And anyway, how we did this presentation, which was filmed, but no one can find the video of it. And so finally the conference organizers recently told me that Cambridge University has it. If I go to Cambridge University, I could get a copy. So I went to them and they said, well, we can't even look for it unless you pay us $30. And then we'll look for it. And so I paid them $30. Then they came back and said, nope, we can't find it. And I said, can you send back the $30? And they said, no. I said, okay, that's like entropy. And so we've just encountered, <laughs> you're selling neg entropy. And <laughs> I just bought some entropy. So thanks very much for Cambridge University. We'll move on. I do wish that I had that video because it was quite fun because at the end, Carl Sagan went off on this trek on how the entire cosmos is obeying the second law of thermodynamics. But at some point, he believes it will stop and reverse itself. And then the entire universe will be based on neg entropy. And then he concluded by saying that if you thought you had trouble with entropy, just wait till you deal with neg entropy going the other way. And it, it, was, it, was, it was quite a great presentation at the time. Uh, to be a little more helpful, harmful, humorous, uh, I think maybe in what you were sent, maybe not, I'm not sure. I talked about the three laws of thermodynamics. Did you see those? Uh, it starts with an encounter. The encounter is there is a game. Shall we say a game of life? First law is you can't win. Second law, you must lose. Third law, you can't quit. And so those are the laws of thermodynamics relative to entropy. And those have been quite helpful in the number of endeavors we've worked on. Uh, I've got a bit deeper, and I will go much deeper in this article for business schools relative to essentially everything taught in a business school is based on a belief of neg entropy, particularly marketing, particularly advertising. And my advice is that find me a single advertising example that does not touch on neg entropy. Otherwise, show me a car commercial that talks about a car 
that's going to need serviced. It really is going to need service during its lifetime. So you better be prepared. Somehow that's never mentioned. I'm not sure why, it just never mentioned. So all of these commercials to be effective are quite optimistic and uh, they do not touch on neg entropy at all. And the same relative to politicians. If they're giving a lecture or campaigning for votes, that in essence, neg entropy is key to what they're selling. Otherwise you don't vote for them, right? Who needs pessimism? Anyway, it goes on and on and on. Uh, I might say that I hope and pray I'm wrong, but it's interesting to spend 60 years working on something that you desperately hope you're wrong. Uh, unfortunately, the data increasingly shows that I'm probably not wrong that in essence, climate change is much faster and much more devastating than we thought back in the 70s. Uh, I don't know if any of you know of Richard Garwin, uh, co-designer of the hydrogen bomb, uh, friend and colleague. He would come to my university and help me put on uh, conferences to talk about nuclear warfare humans and whether they're going to avoid it or not. And then we moved some of them to New York City and held them in convention halls in New York. Uh, great friend, great help. Uh, he also was quite down on humans using neg entropy as an excuse for all kinds of things. And his one argument was that just watch the news every now and then when you see a major proposal being sent to the government asking for one or two billion dollars to continue the research they're doing. He says you can count on that being a neg entropy search. That one to two billion is always to find an example of neg entropy someplace, which many of the participants know they're not going to find. But it's a fantastic way of giving, getting government money to do research that you can get incredible funding every few years by advertising you're almost there with neg entropy, just a little bit more, maybe 1 billion more, then we'll have her. And so Richard Garwin, still alive, but uh, quite old. Uh, he was quite good in these conferences uh, relative to the same distinction. Uh, maybe a final point I'd like to make which this uh, confuses or upsets people, but the people I most respect argue that entropy defines time. Time does not define entropy. But in most textbooks and most science and most places, uh, the speaker or the writer talks about entropy defined by time. And those that I most enjoy go out of their way to say, no, no, no. Entropy is far more powerful than the idea of time. Time is actually a bit more fluid. Time is a bit negotiable. Entropy is not. And so they're quite clear. So when someone gives me that definition, I know what camp they're coming from. It's uh, quite clear. And most people really get upset by the idea that entropy defines time. They find that upsetting. Hopefully, no one here does. Uh, any comments? Sorry, I spoke too long, David. No, I have comments, but I'm going to wait and see if anybody else does. OK, uh, I'll give the opportunity, and then I'll come back to Vadra and uh, Kelly again if we don't have any questions. Um, I know Joanne had actually gone off on to, it looks like she switched to phone. I'll give her an opportunity if she actually wants to speak because she can't raise her hand. <laughs> no for Joanne. Does anyone else have a comment they'd like to make? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Sean Patrick here. I don't disagree with the premise around entropy, but I guess I would say I'm a cynical but optimistic environmentalist. <laughs> um, so part of it is framing. 
Um, so I agree with you at one scale, but I think it's not actually an issue of optimism versus pessimism. It's a question about self versus other and the relationship there at kind of the top thinking of the system. So the fact that we have a concept called trash in our language is indicative of a belief that you're talking about. You can just throw things out and there, it doesn't matter. Um, that like works through a whole bunch of cultural values that can be changed. We'll get like this gets into how you do uh, public campaigning, which is what I do over the long term. But um, I think at that space, when you look at things in that frame, uh, if you talk to someone from an indigenous background, they'll also talk about the lack of relations um, and that we think in binaries often. Um, so yeah, I think the top level, I, I also have a problem with techno solutionism in these other pieces and that the challenge in front of us is very broad. But I think it's also the framing of how we think that will be important for finding solutions. Um, I've spent a lot of time fighting corporations and government. We can talk in detail about how to do that. But yeah, just the top comment, I agree with the general premise, but I think for finding solutions, the frame is kind of at a different value level. Over, mm -hmm. that's a good presentation. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could make a small response. I, I, I like your comment. Uh, for me, uh, humans in essence are entropic machines. Mm -hmm. That in essence, entropy goes on whether humans are around or not. That's the law of the universe. What humans do is aid it and allow it to go faster. But backing off from that, we can argue, I think, quite well that some humans uh, have found ways to aid it much less that in <laughs> fact to slow down the human dimension, uh -huh. whereas others have greatly speeded up. And so some colleagues now were looking at uh, the role of billionaires as adding to entropy. Oh, that yeah. uh, in essence, they're terribly valuable to keep entropy wound up and going full speed, mm -hmm. if not even more. Yeah. And so in essence, we need another way of uh, humans living or humans being as uh, uh, Mohammed had raised that in essence, we don't have to be quite as entropic as we uh, are. And, and so there's a huge gradation. And so if you go to uh, countries we consider uh, more primitive, uh, well, let's not go there. Let's instead go out to some of the Indian reservations in the US. And in fact, within the Lakota mm. Indian grounds, uh, they live very, very differently and quite low in tropic compared to the neighbors uh, further east in South Dakota. So in essence, there's a lifestyle there which we could learn a great deal from, from the uh, Lakota. And in fact, I, I was advisor to the well, I hate to say king, but let's say the chief of the Lakotas for two years. And he and I had an awful lot of fun doing that. But in essence, uh, I put together a constitution for the Lakota on how to get rid of the old man's council. Because I felt the old council was the major problem for the Indians. And if indeed they put together a new council of 12 to 15 year olds, uh, they would do much better meeting the future. And I even stipulated in the Constitution that preferably it's teenagers that have tried to commit suicide, or at least thought carefully about it, because they would be the ones that would most understand how bad we're doing. Mm -hmm. And at least they would bring some hope into what we're doing. So anyway, the Lakotas rejected my Constitution and me. And uh, I think my last act was to arrange for the Secretary General of the UN to go and give a keynote, keynote speech at the headquarters of Lakota to talk about some of the things that we're talking about here, to talk about them as, shall we say, a doorway into a better future. Uh, that talk, I think, was going to be great. I think the Secretary General was fantastic. Then some, shall we say, uh, European ancestry friend got involved and wanted to take over credit for what the UN person was gonna say and how it related to his values. And the UN person disappeared and said, I can't take it. That's like business as usual. And so he mm -hmm. killed uh, 
some great things the Lakotas were going to try and realize. But nonetheless, if you look at indigenous tribes, th there is a lot of learning that can take place there. Uh, if you look at billionaires, also you can learn a lot on what not to do and how to have a sense of humor and how not to vote for them, make, make fun of them. I'm going to turn back to Sean and uh, see if you have a rejoinder. <laughs> yeah, just, I won't jump into the the details, but I'll just use the example of uh, your section three negative entropy and obstacle to improved environmental relations. Yep. Um, I've worked on environmental energy standards and the I know yep. the Energy Star background. Yep. Uh, one of the premises in the project that you were given were, was that business and government standards were seen as unacceptable. Yep. That's based on uh, value basis and mindsets. Yep. So if you look in the public campaigning world, like what we're actually doing right now um, in different parts of civil society are actually trying to change the values that determine government and corporate behavior. Right. So some laws you can't have right now because you know it's not seen as acceptable to say tell Canadian banks that right. you can't profit from climate change. Right. Uh, I'll say it in about five years, we'll probably have a law that says that. Um, so there's different ways to go at these problems. And that's why I was just saying, raising it to the higher level, sure. like whether it's an indigenous community or not, mm -hmm. as opposed to just, uh, I guess, no, that's... letting go to the uh, the paral being paralyzed by entropy. But no, yeah. those, those are great examples. I, I appreciate much. I don't know if you, I don't know if I include in the paper, but I, I was the founder of Energy Star Homes. So I designed that project and got it running for two years. And then I walked away because the lobbyists got them to modify the standards to make it more acceptable. So I, I walked away from them in humor and decided it wasn't going to work. Uh, we had a much better project that, that all of us would have enjoyed, uh, which was done 10 years earlier by taking a section of Newark, New Jersey, like four to eight blocks and suspend all regulation, all buildings, all zoning, all anything. In that section of Newark, no regulations would be allowed, period. And the governor is my ally. And so he and I mapped out an area that we were going to demonstrate alternatives because often the regulation is counterproductive, if not just wrong. And we got 40 companies signed up to each build something in that domain to show what they could do if regulation wasn't there, to show how they could demonstrate a better way. And it was uh, fantastic proposals. Uh, I had to leave for a year or two and go back to Sweden on a project. So we sort of suspended it till I got back. When I got back, the project had been moved to Atlantic City by Donald Trump's people. That Donald Trump's people saw it as a fantastic project to build his uh, casino and save a lot of money. And so <laughs> my project got destroyed by this mm -hmm. asshole called Donald Trump. And so I met with him once on it and explained why the governor and I were going to leave him, that he could have his casino. Good luck. But in essence, it, it's quite possible to do some really exciting stuff with the right people. Mm -hmm. And so you're exactly right by having that touch of optimism. Mm -hmm. There's, and those 40 companies, the things they proposed were phenomenal. I mean, I, you know, sort of mind blowing what they wanted to do to demonstrate how they could do things better. So, so you're quite right to have that optimism. It's just hard to lay the basis for it or the foundation. Mm. There's Donald Trump's all over. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn to Don, who had his hand up. Nishad is after Don, but uh, Don. Yeah, let's make sure I've got my, where am I? Oh, just, oh, there I am. Okay, yeah, and I'm not muted. Okay. Yeah, a couple of observations, um, or maybe superficial, but I don't know. I think we've got some deeper implications as well. Anyway, you can be the judge. Um, I see that uh, the people who put up the uh, the web telescope 
have uh, discovered uh, as they look at the pictures coming in that we may have to change uh, our belief in the origins and the laws of physics because they have discovered things so outlandish and so beyond what they had ever imagined that almost everything we've got has got to be re-examined at the very least. Now, the scientists are excited as hell. It means there's more work for them. But the implications for a, a whole lot of things that are entrained with that um, are kind of mind-boggling. And we may be looking at not so much as entropy as being the inevitable down, downgrading of everything, but chaos as being the inexplicable element that makes everything go kablooey in any in every direction. But that, that's just a, a, a general observation. Uh, I'm not really qualified to comment on just what, what it is, and besides which the articles I read weren't detailed enough to, to give me a better grasp. But I, I take them at their word. It was the New York Times that published it, so it has some credibility. The other piece is, I think, more something I, I do understand a little better. Uh, and that is what it is that motivates people to do stuff or not do stuff. It turns out that the marketing people have discovered um that people don't want to do new things if they have to give up old things. And it's not simply because they value them that much. It's because it's a whole lot of extra work and a whole lot of extra thinking and a whole lot of emotional turmoil as they, as they kick this around in their heads. Now, you can see this in, a, 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 in application almost everywhere, right? In politics, in business, in personal possessions. People become hoarders. Everybody hoards to some extent, I believe. How many garages actually contain cars? I don't know. Um, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. And it's something that I don't think the people who, who are optimistic, the negentropists, if you like, uh, have really um, cottoned on to. Um, no, I, and I don't think absolutely... It, even if the what I'm saying about the you know the the laws of physics not being clear, and that's a long way back and a long way off, so hey, may not have much effect on us for a few hundred years, but we certainly could do do better, uh, and we we certainly could slow down some of the things, but we kind of get people interested in doing it, and frankly. We've got, I think we've got a system based on denial. I think advertising is all about getting people not to look at the damage done. Why do I have to buy a new iPhone every three years? For God's sakes, what a waste of money. I can, I've can. i mastered the old ones, you know? <laughs> uh, it, it's just beyond belief uh, how crazy we are about unex exponential growth constantly, all the time. It's nuts. But... Um, it, it it seems to be part of our our um, nature, but uh, I think the real reason is it's, it's a way of denying our deeper understanding that everything is winding down, especially our old crock bodies, right? Yeah. And that those would be my observations. I, I, I like very much what you said. Uh, maybe to touch on the chaos bit, uh, back in the early nineties. I think it's 90s, could have been 80s. Uh, I used to give IBM lectures when they had their research headquarters on 42nd Street in Manhattan. And every now and then I got to lecture along with this funny guy called Mandelbrot. <laughs> and so Mandelbrot and I would put right. on presentations <laughs> where he would present chaos theory and his fundamental development of chaos theory. And mm -hmm. then I would try to fit in entropy and other aspects of it and I I enjoyed very much his his uh, manner of presentation uh -huh. and I think the chaos people are still taking off of Mandelbrot that yeah. he continues to be almost sacrosanct in the area whatever you know whoever got a billion dollars to show that it's different uh his work is still pretty basic and, and then you touched on the idea of change or changelessness and I also make a big deal of changelessness and that I think the vast majority of people are very much into changelessness. And, and I think you're being too nice I, I, by saying they're lazy or whatever, that I think 
a lot of them are paranoid about change. Mm -hmm. And in essence, one of the major vehicles they use to hang on to changelessness, we call culture. Yeah. And yeah. so when I get into an argument with my Chinese friends uh, almost weekly, I point out that culture is a major stumbling block, block you know, that if you could suspend <laughs> Chinese culture for an mm -hmm. hour and tell me something different, and they get very angry because they say, you're a typical American that has no culture. <laughs> and, and it's on and on and on. But yes. changelessness is quite an impediment for humans. Mm -hmm. And it's been around a long time. Uh, let's see, uh, David, Parmenides was the great Greek that argued for changelessness because he argued that if it changes, it's not there. So why talk about it? It was gone. It's gone. So only yeah. that which never changes is alive and well and important. Uh, then Heraclitus came along after Plato screwed things up by agreeing with Parmenides, came along and said that uh, the only thing that relates to changelessness is death. That if something's alive, it keeps changing. Mm -hmm. So you guys are talking about death mm -hmm. and paying too much attention to death. So yeah. Heraclitus was sort of the hero of change and not well liked, that that it didn't sell well no. and still does not sell well. So that's sort of where we're okay. at. And, and I, I think you raise a very important issue. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move to Nishat. Yeah, I'm act I was actually I was actually gonna talk about uh, a similar point. So you, you mentioned that 95% of people prefer negentropy. They don't like entropy. Something like 95% uh, yeah. would rather go with negentropy. I'm being optimistic. <laughs> okay. And uh, my question is, why do most people uh, not like entropy? Is it is it directly related to what you just said? Is it because people hate change? Is it no, because they... people know that they're going away and everything's going away in a few years anyway. You know, and it, it's it's that, but it's sort of clearer than that. Have you ever noticed that a five-year-old begins to change? Something about a five-year-old. Uh, at some point, they look down and they see a death certificate hanging around their neck and it begins to bother them. So the idea of mortality becomes quite mm -hmm. irritating to humans. And so they spend the rest of their life trying to find ways to be immortal, shall we say. And probably the last fallback position is have children. Yeah. So in essence, that's your immortality trip. Have lots of children and send them off to the future, even though you're gone. And so this idea of a death certificate around your neck when you're born is quite bothersome to people. Like, you know, what's the point? And uh, you find some people that are, particularly some of the billionaires, that are really, really big on immortality. That, boy, they, uh, anyway, it's humorous, but for them, I think it's serious. So neg entropy is almost everything for them. Does that help, hurt, dumb? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to switch to Kelly. Because Kelly had her hand up. Hi. The host is file out of the vi video. Oh, no. Know. I'm just so going to you, go. Goodbye. You, 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 have, you have your hand up, so um, yeah. go, go ahead. There's something on my screen, so I just want to get rid of it. Um, David Hawk, we, we didn't speak about um, that the opportunities in terms of... Um, Part of the problem is how individuals and societies or cultures uh, have an attitude towards uh, change. And in changing attitudes is one thing, and that's where the youth are at, is that they have a change in attitude, but their behaviors uh, don't uh, relate to, the, their actions don't relate to what they're doing. So somewhere there is that opportunity in terms of uh, how is it that we change what is more and what is less? 
Yeah, no, I, I think you opened a very nice doorway by mentioning youth, because there is a lot of hope with youth. And much of my time is spent trying to be helpful about youth. So this silly TV program, I guess I'm going to start. Uh, the sponsors claim it's mostly for youth. They said reasonable adults will not bother with uh, what I'm talking about. And so they assume that youth will tune in for what we're talking about on that TV program. And I, and I tend to favor youth. I, uh, yeah, I, I tend to be a particularly troublesome to old white guys like me that, uh, that, uh, yeah, one of them mistakenly stopped by my house yesterday that he's lived next to me for 40 years and never been here. And he stopped. He stopped because Anna Lena was out watering the roses. And for those that don't know Anna Lena, she's a rather tall, quite beautiful blonde lady. And so he came skidding into my driveway to ask what happened to me. <laughs> and of course, he wanted to talk to her. So then I, of course, went out and I shouldn't have. That was a mistake. And then uh, he left before long. But in essence, uh, old white guys, particularly farmers, are, are quite angry about, I think the expression is the shit that I talk about. And that they, uh, but as their yields drop precipitously, they begin to think something's wrong, but they figure out it's me that somehow God is really angry at me and punishing them. And so if they could get rid of me, their crops would catch up. And there'd be lots of corn and beans again. <laughs> it's tough out there. Sorry. I don't... Youth, have, youth, have, youth offer a lot of hope and also a lot of humor if you could get them to stop talking about suicide. And a lot of them are. And most are saying they don't want to have children. It, it's becoming quite different. David, as yep. you predicted earlier, I have a hand up, but I can't put my hand up. Okay, let me uh, bring Joanne up then. Just hold on. Uh, mind. There you oh, go. Joanne. Yay. Wow. <laughs> I made it. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, all the contributions for David um, Kelly, Barad, thank you for uh, kind of opening this can, can of worms. Um, I do have something that um, as everyone was speaking, um, a few things came up for me. So I'm a designer and I naturally live in the world of optimism, <laughs> which is um, something that I, I battle with, you know, I know designers are a big part of the reason why we are where we are and finding ways to, um, I do also believe we're going to be part of the solution, but um, I am in my inquiry phase of how, how to come to terms with that. Um, but one thing that um, has come up for me in these conversations are that we are privileged enough to be having this conversation so we're maybe um just but a, a tiny amount of people who are capable of talking this way about changelessness or change and that um a couple of times people have brought up culture and stumbling with culture and changelessness and for me um the the culture piece is so critical because we have so much of the people functioning inside of a suffocating system where we are working literally to death <laughs> some people can't even stop to think um they are excluded from inter interdisciplinary dis um uh crossovers in that and and that can be through um david thank you for sharing your experience about being excluded in certain courses and being excluded from some of that 
education piece, if we were just to magnify that to the global population and just um, how many people fall into that category that are being excluded from even possible solutioning. So um, I don't even know where I'm going with this per se. Um, it's just some things that, uh, that I'm feeling as you guys are speaking. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I guess I, I'll leave it there. I'm, I'm sure there were some other things. And I think uh, Donald also brought up um, that changelessness and uh, not wanting to let go of old stuff. And, and I think that's what, David, you were talking about, including um, on that constitution piece. I think that's what you were talking about, um, bringing in these 15 year olds who are actually living the reality and how that um, that piece is so critical because again they've probably been excluded for um, due to many reasons but you know uh, yeah I do think there's something really critical there and I'll leave it there because right. I don't know uh, where I'm heading <laughs> this no it's uh, fantastic I, I thank you very much for raising that I'll, I'll give you two quick examples uh, one, when I was temporarily allowed to teach at Iowa State University, uh, 1980, 81, uh, I had a design studio in architecture. And for the design studio, we called it the entropy studio. So how would you design buildings differently if entropy mattered? <laughs> the students were fantastic. And a banner they put over the doorway into the design studio read, uh, Remember, it's very hard to kill a talent. That was for the other faculty. So they were warning the faculty that <laughs> their talent was still alive. And, and in fact, it became some of a famous studio because one night they took out a 200 pound window because it was a stretch skin, brand new architecture building that had was sealed. So no outside air could get in except through the ventilation system. So they removed a huge plate glass and put in pallet double hung windows and plywood so they could open the windows and have ventilation in their studio. Well, of course, two ended up getting kicked out of the university and they, uh, the Des Moines Register did a story on how bad they were destroying government property. But lo and behold, those two got free ride scholarship to the best school of architecture in the US at the time, which was University of Pennsylvania. So they sent them a letter begging them to come and study at Penn and they would be given a free ride scholarship to try another approach to design, which turned out well. Des Moines Register did not do an article on that. They just talked about how bad the students were. Uh, coming forward a few years, uh, at, and, and of course I was fired at that school. Uh, coming forward a few years to a place called New Jersey Institute of Technology, uh, the school was on probation for its accreditation. And so they brought in another professor to try and get it shaped up. And he decided it would be information technology based. Although he knew nothing about it, except he could spell the word, but that would be it. And then two years later, the board of trustees got upset with him because two of them were CEOs of information technology companies in New Jersey. And they looked at the school and thought, what a pile of shit management was. This is embarrassing. And so they said they were going to close the school if it wasn't shaped up. Uh, a new provost, without seeing me, meeting me, uh, put me in as the uh, uh, adjunct dean to get the school accredited. So anyway, I was then given the job as the dean. And so to start the job, I did something which links back to what you just said. Uh, I had a two-day event where I canceled all classes. The school would come together and talk about its future and how business education needs to change. So what does that mean? Uh, I invited the students and the faculty. The first day, students came and faculty. The faculty were very upset about the idea of changing what they were doing. They were particularly upset about losing tenure if the school was closed and the school had no right to threaten that. 
And also they didn't understand why students were in the room because they were in charge. The students should go away. And so anyway, the second day, only one faculty member showed up and lots of students. And the students put together a program on what a business school should be like. It was fantastic. And I took it to the board of trustees and presented their program. The trustees loved it. They unanimously passed on it and let us go ahead. Anyway, the president intervened and disallowed this program by saying that all graduate programs should be closed in business because business schools are used as a place for athletes to hang out until they don't graduate and they finish their athletics. And so there should be no graduate programs in business. And so in essence, he canceled all of the proposals. Anyway, we went ahead with many of the proposals and the school not only got reaccredited, but we won the award from the accrediting body as the most improved school of management in North America because of what the students had done, which the faculty were opposed to and the president hated. So just to reinforce what you said, there is great hope, but how do you get access to that? And how do you allow the hope to do the right things? And uh, after I was fired, I gave a departure lecture in the auditorium for the university on how the importance of it being too late. And so when it's too late, the idiots, and at the time I called them idiots and assholes, go underground, they go into hiding. And so when they're in hiding, other people have the opportunity to do great things because the idiots are out of the way. So during that brief window, you can do some really marvelous things that seem illogical or wrong or against culture. The trouble is, once they work out very well, the idiots come back again and try to crawl back into positions of power. And so I warned the students they should be careful of that last stage when after climate change sets in and they develop ways to deal with it, uh, how to deal with the idiots that wanna take charge again. So I, I couldn't agree more with uh, your concern and I do think there's hope there, but I tend to rely on hopelessness to catch attention. And uh, later I'm gonna show David uh, the diagram that I used to kill Piccadilly Circus Project in London to keep the development going. And, and finally we found that poster. David, I didn't show it to you, did I? Uh, you did actually when I was okay. there. And now, Annalena made a large version of the frame and put on a wall. And the person that made the image in a professional shop, he loved it so much he gave it a title. And he made a copy for himself to put on the wall of how to kill what leadership wanted in development in the center of London. So see, there's hope. Uh, I have uh, one thing to highlight in that story that you mentioned, David, uh, if you allow me. Uh, the uh, when you said that the the top priority for the professor or the top priority for faculty for the faculty was actually not was like if the school closed they would lose tenure, and why students are here? Well, ended up actually what the student did is save the faculty and save their <laughs> tenure. So uh, I just wanted to highlight that how like the very opposite of what they are actually striving for was actually I the mean, solution to see what they wanted. To footnote that what the board of trustees really liked is at the end, the faculty made a statement in writing that if the students knew anything, they wouldn't be here. <laughs> the students <laughs> responded, yep, you're exactly right. <laughs> and the, the trustees love that, that argument and counter argument. Yeah. So there's hope with youth. Okay, so I'm gonna call myself youthful and I'm gonna like um, jump in here. Joanne, um, uh, when David was talking about that there's these small openings or opportunities, it's when I started remarket at the beginning of COVID. I, I put the information for those of you who are in, in Toronto to come and see um, what we hope to scale across Canada and whether it goes down. But Joanne, also uh, as a designer, I certainly, um, that that's my area as well. And 
I certainly encourage you to um, read David Hawk's upcoming book, uh, and I hope that it will give you the spark to be inspired to innovate. It is, uh, it, it's certainly been a 20 plus year uh, journey for me, but it has certainly been worthwhile to find how do we make products for a finite planet. Uh, what I did want to take us back to was that um, the title of, of the paper was Sustainable Technology as a Revisitation um, of, of the Entropy Argument. And I thought that um, for those of us who went to Iowa in an e-car, uh, I was curious to hear on the radio today that with the smart cars, um, you're basically, even a passenger is giving up their rights in terms of all of the information that is being collected by the car companies and potentially sold to other areas. So if you had sex in the car, then you might get, um, who knows what you might get uh, sold to or, or that your um, information is sold to. But I just, you know, when we're talking about the sustainable technology revisitation of the entropy argument, I, I th think that there's something to be said that that the electric car was supposed to replace a uh, petroleum product, but we certainly know of the challenges that we had on the journey in terms of um, the infrastructure that was not uh, readily available. It was not as accessible as we wanted. And yes, we did uh, fill up at, at Walmart. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Yeah, Kelly, did they say anything about the video they were capturing when you had sex in the car? Would they sell that to other people? Or is that kept confidential? Only to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I have to find that piece and read it. I, Kelly, just to reply to you, something that I've come across in my journey, and, and it's been a tough one to fully comprehend, but a car is still a car. And I think that's the problem. A dress is still a dress. Like a, a thing is still a thing. And that goes back to, I think what Donald was saying, how do we, how do we appreciate less? <laughs> I, that's not how you said it, Donald. I, I can't remember precisely, but um, something to that effect. And I think um, that's part of the problem, uh, shifting that mindset and understanding. If I, if I could make the comment, I mean, I certainly told uh, our leading retailers that they should be reselling their designer um, uh, couture garments in, um, in their stores. Uh, they thought I was absolutely off the mark. Uh, it's certainly been a long time since I've shopped at Holt Renfrew, and I've been shopping my closet for a long period of time. I actually thought that we were meeting in person and I was going to wear this uh, dress that I bought for $15. I probably paid $150 in terms of the... Uh, wool that had moth holes in it. And I had an Indian um, uh, cohort of mine do the embroidery on it. But to pay her a fair wage, it cost me $150 in terms of this dress. It is a, a very special dress to me and it has nothing to do with the value. But there is so much that we can do with the existing product that, that's already um, available on us. Now to, to maybe give you a, a code phrase, uh, remember I mentioned Richard Garwin? co-designer of the hydrogen bomb. Yep. And he was the one that uh, mentions the warning every now and then, if humans are involved, be careful. And he says, please remember that the agenda for designing the hydrogen bomb was to eliminate warfare. And then he stops and walks away. So uh, be careful of humans uh, <laughs> and their agendas that so if you're going to make an electric car in order to make the planet a better place, uh, be careful of humans. It's uh, well, as long as they're not involved, you're okay. So I'm going to uh, wind us down for today. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, there will be an announcement for the October System Thinking Ontario coming up. Uh, we are actually, uh, for those of you who made the request of uh, attending uh, to see Judith Rosen, uh, who came in person in Toronto, she's actually agreed to give a presentation um, in, uh, uh, from Rochester, New York. And so um, Zad will be running that session, and we'll see everyone uh, next month. Thanks. Bye. Nice to see everybody. Thank you. Try to be optimistic now. Not by the devil's dictionary as far as your definition. I'm going to stay hopeful.
No, bur burn that dictionary. That's what you have to do to be optimistic. 